Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of Recovery Church's webinar, and we're focusing on the path. And today we're going to look at step one and being powerless. Now, if you're in early recovery, this lesson is something that maybe you really want to understand better this, this step. And maybe you've never uh, engaged sobriety. You're trying to understand what this sobriety is all about. And you're trying to understand even what the first step means or any of that. So as we continue on the path, it says in how it works in uh, AA's big book, it says, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. And so we're going to be talking about the path, and this is the first step, the first plank of that path. And what is the path? Step one, it says, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, over alcohol, over narcotics, whatever it is, that our lives had become unmanageable. Let me talk a little bit about what it means to be powerless. We're unable to produce a particular effect. We're powerless. Um, we're lacking power to act. We're helpless. And that is exactly what, we, what we've been when it comes to drugs and alcohol. When we put drugs or alcohol in us, we become powerless. Powerless to make good decisions. Powerless to stop. Powerless to care about anyone or anything other than ourselves. There's been another power that has entered into our lives. And we talk about unmanageable. Unmanageable is difficult or impossible to manage or control. Now, if we're at this point where we're thinking about what it means to be getting sober, or we have started to get sober, we know that we haven't controlled drugs or alcohol for a long time, and that they've controlled us. <coughs> Excuse me. So certainly there's an unmanageability there. Um, unmanageable means it's difficult to carry or maneuver, unwieldy. Um, our lives have become that. Our lives, the life of an addict is not easy. It may be straightforward because we know that what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish, we're trying to get drunk, we're trying to get high, whatever that looks like, however we're going to get the money to do that, however we're going to fund the next one, that may be straightforward, but our life was not easy. It, it clearly was unwieldy. Now, if you're in, again, trying to discover if sobriety is something that is for you and you're trying to figure it out, Many people will try to do an experiment where, let me see, I'm going to test myself to see if I really do have a problem. Do, let me see if I really, if this is real or I'm just making it up. And I know people have said things to me and I've gotten in trouble with it, but is it really real? And I'll, I'll, before I, I share my own experience with that, if you have tested yourself to see if you have a problem, you probably have a problem. Only addicts or alcoholics test themselves. People who drink normally or use normally, whatever that means, they don't test themselves. They don't try to figure out, am I doing this too much? Have I, have I overindulged in this? That's not what normal people do. So it, there's a good chance that if um, you've tried a test or an experiment to see if you are in fact an addict or an alcoholic, there's probably a pretty good chance that you are. Now, I remember mine. I did the great beer experiment in college. Uh, I, I found myself, I was uh, watching my hometown Eagles. I was, again, in my, in my dorm room at college on my futon, basically on the floor, and I had gotten a case of beer because in Pennsylvania you had to buy it. Um, all the liquor stores were closed on Sunday, so I had pre-planned and I would got a case of these Bush Pounders. I know, Bush Pounders, but that's what I could afford. And, um, and I remember thinking, okay, I'll just see how many I drink during the game. And, you know, we'll, we'll, it'll just be a test between me and just myself. No one else will have to know. No one's here. And I watched the game. I, I don't remember the outcome of the, of the game, but I, I figured at the end of the game, maybe I had three or four, I, you know, I wasn't, I was not uh, trying to uh, count or anything. I was just seeing how it went. And when I went back, I had saved all the cans to see what actually, and I had drank like nine or 10. 
and I had no concept. And that totally scared me. I was like, like I had no concept that that's how much I had drank. And I had failed what I called the great beer experiment. I had tested myself and I had failed. That's also a crushing blow. When you test yourself to say, I, I've got this under control. I know what I'm doing. I can handle this. And then you find out that you, you can't or you didn't. And that, that hurts your ego. It hurts, it, it just hurts your pride that, well, maybe, maybe I don't have this thing. And it becomes one of those red flags. Uh, we, we have red flags throughout our drinking and using like, oh, well, this might be too far. This might have been where, I, like, I don't want to go to this place. And I can't believe I found myself in this place. And I said I would never do this thing. I would never go to this place. I would never do this drug. And here I am and finding myself that I've done exactly what I said I wouldn't do. And so that's one of those things where we have to come to terms with that. Now, let me just encourage you. In regards to being powerless, it is important to admit complete defeat. We have to acknowledge that we have been defeated, which it hurts our pride to do that. We have a mental obsession, this merciless obsession that no amount of willpower can break. I always, I laugh at people who say, ah, oh, addicts and alcoholics, they're so weak-willed. That it couldn't be farther from the truth. Addicts and alcoholics are some of the most strong-willed people you will ever meet. The problem is, so often we've put our, our will in the wrong direction. We've put it in a way that isn't beneficial to ourselves. But if we had to figure out a way in a, a blizzard or a hurricane how to, to, to get high or to get drunk, we would find a way. Even if we were, you know, boiling our, our cough syrup to make sure that we got alcohol, like we would find a way. We are strong-willed people and it's getting that will back in line with God's will. So it's not just our will. And we were hopeless in the sense that we wanted the abnormal to become normal. We wanted our drinking to be normal, and so we would hang out with people who drank like us, or we would use with people who, you know, would ha hang out with people who would use similar to us. Because we couldn't hang out with somebody who drank two or three when we were drinking 10 or 12. Um, you know, we weren't, we weren't gonna hang out with people just who smoked pot if we wanted to shoot up, because we needed to be around people that were like us. And so we normalized our behavior, and then it became normal. Everybody does this. If you don't do this, if you're not drinking 10 or 12 when you're going out, if you're, if you're not snorting or sniffing or shooting, like, what's wrong with you? You're clearly not normal. Like, you're such a, you know, a square, a dork, whatever you want to say. Like, you are not, you're, you're not normal. And we had made the abnormal normal. We had made the things that we had done normal. And I want you to know, if you're in a blackout and you've had a blackout, that's not normal. If you've driven drunk or high, that's not normal. If you hide drugs and alcohol, or you hide the amount that you have, that's not normal. So we try to make the abnormal normal. We were out of control. It wasn't just a habit. It wasn't just a, some fun thing we did on the weekend. It controlled us. Even if we were a binge drinker or a binge user where we could wait till whatever the specified time was that we could actually uh, engage in the activity, it still was no mere habit, and we knew that. Um, one of the things that we have realized, especially as you enter into uh, sobriety and, and as you're trying to understand sobriety, we could never be the same again. When we've, when we've gone into alcoholism, when we've gone into addiction, we, we can't be the same. It's a statistical fact that alcoholics almost, and addicts almost never recover on their own resources. We don't do this on our own. We do this together. We do this in community. One of the beautiful things about the first step, it says, we admitted. It doesn't say I admitted, which it could have. 
it, it understands that collectively, community-wise, how important that is. We admitted we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. We had admitted that because we needed to do this together. Now, no real addict or alcoholic ever recovers control. If we think that we're going to get sober for a little while and then we'll regain control, it is a myth. It's an illusion. And it's just, it's not something that's going to happen. Uh, so many of my friends that I know who have gotten sober from heroin have said, if I just, now that I've been clean for a little while, if I get high again, I'll, I'll ex maybe experience that same high as that first time, that what I was chasing for so long. And um, maybe this time I'll control it a little different or a little better. I'll, I'll manage it better. And it is an illusion. And too often when people have been sober for a while and then they re-engage, especially when it comes to narcotics, the, the consequences can, can literally be deadly. And that's one of the reasons we have Recovery Church. Not only do we want you to have success and have success in sobriety, success in faith, we want to break the cycle of death. Now, there may be other addictions out there, but like if you order too much from Amazon and it arrives in the next day because you had Prime, you're not going to die. You may go into bankruptcy, but you're not going to die. Alcohol and drugs have the potential to kill you. The statistics are everywhere and it, it is harrowing. The amount of people that die every day from narcotics is the, the same as if a 737, a plane, crashed every single day of the year in America. The crazy thing is a set, two 737s crashed recently and they grounded the entire fleet for the world because two of them did it. Every single day in America, the amount of people that die is equivalent to a 737. Uh, this is the first time in the history of our nation that the life expectancy has gone down. It has, we're, we are not expected to live as long specifically because there are so many OD deaths. If, you're, if you have someone in your life under 35, I have three children, there's a greater chance that my children, the children, anyone under 35, has a greater chance of dying today due to OD than a car crash. That's why we're doing this. That's why we wanna make sure that we, we were clear that an addict will never regain control. So dabbling with it, there's, there is no dabbling. Dabbling causes death. And we can't afford another person to succumb to this addiction, to, to alcoholism and addiction. There's no such thing as making a normal drinker or normal addict, a normal user out of an addict or an alcoholic. It's, it's just not true. I heard uh, someone once share at a meeting, once you go from being a cucumber to a pickle, you can never be a cucumber again. And that's not saying that you can't get healthy or because um, clearly you can, but in regards to drugs and alcohol, whenever you cross that line, whatever that line is, if there is even a line to be into addiction and alcoholism, there's no going back. There's sobriety, but there's no regaining this, I can have control, I can have a little, I can have some, I can have non-alcoholic beers, I can just smoke pot instead of uh, snort stuff. It, it just, it doesn't work that way. Most of us have believed that if we remain sober for a long enough stretch that we could then drink or use again normally. And it's just not true. We found that we just, we often were just where we left off. It doesn't matter if it's weeks, months, even years, if we pick up, we pick up and it seems that we pick up pretty much right where we were. It does not take long, if at all, to, to regain uh, that ability to drink or use in significant amounts. Once an alcoholic, once an addict, always an alcoholic, always an addict. In that sense, we can never drink again. We can never use again. And not as a label, not because we're a victim, but as a disease sufferer. Imagine you had asthma and you inhaled your asthma medicine in the morning and 
especially on one of those hard days. But then, you know, someone said, hey, I mean, you've already taken your puffer. You, can, you don't have to do that anymore. I mean, you've taken it once. You, you should be good. Well, that would be silly. No one would say that to an asthma sufferer. So why do people say that to an alcoholic or an addict? Well, you've been sober for a while. It'll be okay now. It won't be okay. They either have a, a short memory or we've romanced it to the point where we say, well, that sounds good. I think I could do that. That's, it's a lie. It is a lie. It's failed reasoning and it do, won't hold us in check. How often did insane ideas win out? When we were using, we'd be like, well, I know I have this thing later today, but if I just do a little bit, maybe it won't be as bad. Maybe, maybe um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll do a little, I'll get ready and I'll go to the event. How often did we miss the event? Or then, or we went to the event, if we made it to the event, and we were in no shape to be at that event. And people didn't, maybe didn't even want us at the event. Whether it's a birthday, a work function, whatever it is. How many things did we blow off because we had this insane idea? Well, I'll just, you know, it's noon. I'll be fine by seven. And we didn't show up. We showed up wasted, high. We had these insane ideas. And we've heard the, the definition of insanity, of doing the same thing and expecting different results. How often did we say, well, I'll just, you know, I'll have a beer with my, my sandwich. I'll be good. And then we're at the end of the day, we're banging on the, the bar going, how did I get so drunk? How did, how did this happen? Um, how did I not end up going back to work? How did I miss that function? The book the big book states the alcoholic will be absolutely an addict will be absolutely unable to stop using on the basis of self-knowledge. Just because you know about addiction isn't enough. Just because you've been to rehab, even if you've done steps in rehab, it doesn't mean that you know uh, that that will keep you sober because self-knowledge will not keep you sober. Quite as important is the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all of our problems. Interestingly, the big book states in regards to self-knowledge and, and spiritual things, it, the big book states, this is a point in regards to the basis of self-knowledge we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize, to smash home. It has been revealed to us out of bitter experience that the addict will absolutely be unable to stop on the basis of self-knowledge. But what has been outlined in the program, the 12-step programs are a spiritual answers and a program of action. That spirit, those spiritual principles, they solve our problems. It, it doesn't make sense, especially to someone who's just trying to stop using, stop drinking. We've talked about, and we will talk about surrender. And I was taught early on, surrender is simply just going over to the winning side. It's, it's kind of like being traded from a last place team to a winning team ready to make a playoff run. Uh, but our pride sometimes says, I don't want to surrender. I don't want to admit complete defeat. I don't want to go from the losing side to the winning side because that would have mean I was already on the losing side. But I, I love that we've been traded to the winning team. It's, it's not like uh, that we were a loser and now we're a winner. We just were positioned now to succeed when in, in the past we weren't. The addict and alcoholic at certain times, we have no effective mental defense against the first drink. There, we, we find ourselves in a situation where our mind, our will, there's not enough that will say, just us gritting our teeth and saying no will not be enough. Our defense must come from a higher power. We must have that spiritual intervention from God in, combi in combined with our self-will, combined with our knowledge, combined with all those things. But there will be a time where the only thing that stands be between us and a drink and us and a drug is God, our higher power. In Proverbs, it tells us in Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Isn't that what our whole life of addiction was like? 
a dog returning to our vomit. The scripture says we're a fool to do that, but that's what we did in our, our addiction. And sometimes we literally did that. We returned to the place of vomit. We, were put, we returned with vomit on us. But like a dog that returned, they're a fool to repeat that folly. And we, were, we would repeat again and again. And the scripture in verse 12 says, Do you see a person who is wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for them. If we think we, we know what we're doing, that self-knowledge, I've got this. I don't need the program. I don't need the steps. I don't need God. I don't need any of that stuff. The scripture would say, you're being a fool. You're about to be a dog that returns to their vomit. And that's, that's not where we want to be. Our addictive behaviors have been our folly. It has made fools out of us again and again and again, whether in relationships with those of the people that we love, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, again and again, they, they made fools of us. And just as the dog returns to what it knows and is familiar with, even though it may be unhealthy and nasty uh, from uh, an objective world, view, world point of view, the dog still returned. We still returned. We still returned to those places, even though they weren't healthy. But it was what we knew, and it was familiar with us. We didn't know how to break the cycle. The step, the path, it'll help you break that cycle. In reality, we have really become addicted and have let the addiction rule our reason rather than the other way around. Our addiction would indicate what we would do rather than we, uh, with us, saying to our addiction, this is what we're going to do. Our addiction led us. It led us into places that we didn't want to be. We didn't have control. We didn't have say over some of those things. In Romans, Paul writes in Romans 7, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh, in the things that I do, in my addiction. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry that out. Isn't that been our story? Our story of trying to get sober. I know what is, is right, and I want to do what's right. I want to do the good things, but I self-destruct. I make the wrong decisions. I go the wrong direction. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do is what I keep on doing. I don't want to get high. I don't want to, to, to make these mistakes, but yet I find myself doing it again and again. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I have sin in me that makes me go the wrong direction. So I find it to be law that when I, do, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. When you want to start to get sober, there will be so many temptations. Why do you think the program talks about people, places, and things? Because your old lifestyle doesn't want to give you up. Your old lifestyle isn't just going to say, okay, sure, go get better. The old lifestyle will beckon you. Your friends will beckon you. They'll say, I don't understand why you're doing this. Because some of it shines a spotlight on what they're doing. But they don't want that. For I delight in the law of God. In my inner being, in the things in me, I delight in God, in his love, in his grace, in his forgiveness. But I see in my members, another, my, my members, my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in all my parts. This is a battle. When we say we're powerless, that we are powerless over sin. That, when sin comes in, it has power. And we do the things that we do not want to do, which is why we need that law of God. That's why we need to be uh, encouraged by this. This is a classic passage for all addicts that tells of how the Apostle Paul ultimately was powerless over the sin in his life apart from the power of God. And we find in addiction and in recovery the same. Paul had, to dwell, to, had the will to do what was right, but at the same time, he also had the inclination to do what brought him into the captivity of sin, to, to do the wrong thing, to, to make the wrong decision. We find ourselves back at the same old self 
destructive behaviors that, have, that we've grown accustomed to and have become so much a part of our lives. In our flesh, we're not able to carry through on staying away from our addictive behaviors, even though we may want to and know at some level how self-destructive they are. But I want to encourage you right now that there is hope. There is freedom. There is sobriety. There is recovery. And that's what the path is all about. Rarely have we seen a person who has thoroughly followed our path. If you're struggling today with, as an alcoholic or an addict, or even you're not sure if you're even able to term yourself that, know that there is freedom and that there is hope. That you, there is, powerless doesn't mean that we are victims. That we are powerless over drugs and drinks simply means that we've acknowledged the thing that has been eroding our success. Most importantly, although that we're powerless, there is a power that we get to tap into. There is a power that's greater than ourselves. Some refer to it as a higher power. Some refer to it as God. Some people refer to it specifically as Jesus. But know today that if you're powerless, that there is a power that is greater than yourself, that you can tap into and that will help bring about sobriety. My encouragement today for you is know that there is a power for you, but most of all know that you are loved. You are loved more than anything and that God wants you to be sober. Let Jesus help you with a spiritual awakening. It talks about that in the, the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message. That was the message we tried to carry and practice in our, all our, the principles in all our affairs. Today, you can start on that path to spiritual awakening. Know that God created us to be in relationship with Him. That's how God made us. And I don't ever want to have one of these sessions or an opportunity to, when I'm speaking with you to not give you the opportunity to understand that or embrace that fact. Know today that God created you to be in relationship, but our sin, our, our, our shortcoming, our addiction, those things have separated us from the presence of God. And sin, it can't be removed by good deeds. It can't be removed by even going to a bunch of meetings or doing all the steps. But paying the price, because there's a price for sin, but paying the price, Jesus died. He paid that price. And then, even more incredibly, not only did he die for our sins because he was in a position to do so, he, he was raised again from the dead. So not only did he pay for our sins, he gave us access to God. And everyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life, which means life that begins right now, today, and it goes on forever. Know today that you can have that. If you have questions or are exploring that, you can, you can uh, message me, you can put a comment in the video, but know today that you are loved and that you can become sober. You can live a sober life as we acknowledge our powerlessness, our unmanageability. And as we continue on the path, God doesn't just leave us in a powerless state. We're going to see in the upcoming steps where there is power and how we can plug into it. I pray that you are able to experience the love of God today in a tangible way. I send my love to you, and I pray that you have a great and sober day. This is Recovery Church, 12 steps, one goal. God bless.